Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father, we come before you. Lord, we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here. Lord, we don't take it for granted that we get to come into the house of God to worship you, to lift you high, to, to acknowledge and exalt you. Lord, we don't come for tradition. We don't come for ritual. We come to hear from you. And Lord, we acknowledge that it's Jesus that's the senior leader of this church. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with here at this place. And Lord, we are so blessed. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we ask that the, what you've blessed us with, Lord, that you would give and bless to the other churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't ever think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather we really are co-laborers, workers together in your kingdom to build your kingdom for your glory. So Father, we ask that you'd bless all the churches across the Inland Empire locally and around the world that are preaching and teaching and, and administering the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Lord, thank you for our brothers and sisters. Lord, we ask that you would bless and, and your hand would be upon those across the other side of the world right now in, the, in the, uh, Nepal and the areas affected by that great earthquake. Lord, we just ask that that's an area, a region that needs to hear about Jesus and to experience your love. So, Father, even in the midst of this great tragedy, we ask that your goodness and your glory would shine in a nation that needs to know about Jesus Christ. And, Father, we ask that you would be with them and our brothers and sisters who are out there right now ministering and, and helping with the efforts of that great earthquake. And, Father, we thank you. Lord, most importantly today, we ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us. Speak to us today. Help us to prepare our ears and our eyes to see and hear and our hearts to receive your word, Lord. And we thank you that we'd take it, we'll walk out of this place and shine your glory for a lost and dying world to see. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. amen. Well, I thought before we get into it, uh, uh, the message today, I thought I'd tell you a little joke. So as I'm telling you the joke, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number six. So I heard the story about a, a pastor, a preacher. He was on a boat and he fell in the water in the ocean, but he couldn't swim. So there he cried out to God, Lord, save me. Just as he cried out to God, a boat came by and the captain of that boat said, do you need some help, sir? And the man said to the captain, no, God will save me. So then another boat came by and another captain or another owner of the boat said to the preacher, do you need help, sir? And again, he cried out, no, God will save me. Shortly thereafter, the preacher drowned. When he got to heaven, he asked God, God, why didn't you save me? And God says to him, you fool, I sent you two boats. <laughs> Sometimes we miss out on hearing God. Today we're going to talk about it as we continue the subject of the pursuit of God. We're in part number three. We're going to talk about some very important things. And I want to really shed some light, some understanding on in the importance of pursuing God in certain areas. Today, looking at the presence of God, as we sang in that song, your presence is heaven, as well as the voice or hearing from God. Two huge parts of our lives and in our walks with God, in our walks with Jesus Christ. So in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible for man to please God. Why? Because he who comes to God, the pursuit of God, coming to God, must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Last week we talked about diligently seeking after God to expend our resources pursuing God. The previous week, or the first part of this, we realized that our pursuit of God doesn't come from our intellectual understanding or our intellectual pursuit of knowing about God, of seeking after God as an ideology, of God as a deduction of evidence that we, we must conclude that he's real because we've seen it, but rather to seek after God as his desire is to be sought in person because he is a person or a personality that can be cultivated into a relationship. So today we're going to look even deeper into this pursuit of God and looking at that statement that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You know, looking at the history of, of the church, looking at those uh, men who have come before us and women who have gone before us that have changed the world. I think of men who came after Jesus, men like Paul the Apostle. Or men like Augustine, or men like uh, uh, Martin Luther, men like John Wesley, who literally turned the world upside down for the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are men that, that what they did, the impact that they had on the world could not have been done because of some stories, could not have been done because of what somebody just said to them that they repeated. There was something about these men. These men, through their lives, exemplified the pursuit of God. 
Each and every one of these men pursued after God with all of their lives. And like Hebrews 11 chapter, verse number 6 says, the Bible says that God rewarded them. But you got to understand that the reward wasn't the reward of the flesh. The reward of the flesh, our desire is I want fame, I want fortune, I want blessing, I want notoriety. The reward that they received was the reward that the soul and that the spirit needed. And that reward was that they experienced the presence of God in their lives and they heard the voice of God. You cannot change the world like those men did without experiencing God's presence and without hearing God's voice. But today I want to tell you something. That's not just for the men who turn the world upside down for the gospel of Jesus Christ to experience and to hear. What if I was to tell you today that that's God's desire for you? To experience his presence and to hear his voice. That the reward of those who diligently seek him is to live a life in the presence of God and to live a life in an intimate and understanding relationship where you hear the voice of God. That is the reward the soul needs. Today, I think, as we get into the subject of the pursuit of God, if we shed some light, and as we shed some light on those two areas, the presence and the voice of God, I believe that the application is in the right understanding of these two areas. But even after that, I'll give you some practical application if you miss it while we're talking about it today on how to better cultivate your pursuit with God. But today I believe that if we press in deeper, we can understand what it means to have a life in pursuit of God. I mean, you think about it like this. The place in which the king's presence is felt and the which the king's voice is heard is in his inner court, his inner circle. Not, nobody, not just anybody spends time there, but when you're in the inner court of the king, you can see his facial expressions. You can experience his presence as well as you can hear his voice. I love how the psalmist says that one day in the court of God is better than a thousand. He says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. You think of the doorkeeper, I mean, the image that he's putting there, I think of like the Buckingham Palace, you know, those, those guys in England and they, they wear their red jacket and the, the, the big black hat and they stand at the door and you can go in front of them and make all the faces and try to get their attentions and they don't move and then there's the guys inside the palace and they wear those really tall socks and the white wigs and they stand at the door. The psalmist says, I would rather be that guy standing a position at a door all day than dwelling in intimacy with the tents of the wicked. Why? Because one day in the inner presence, in the courts of God is better than a thousand. You see, it's in the inner presence, it's in the inner courts of God that our soul receives its just and needed reward of his experience of his presence and the sound of his voice. And I believe today that when we press in to understand what it means to, to grab a hold of this presence and to hear God's voice, I believe that when we shed light on these, that we can have a better pursuit, a deeper pursuit, a richer pursuit of God in our lives. That takes us from just being a nominal or regular Christian to being a Christian whose life changes those around us as well as the world. Because that's what God's desire is for us today. So let's press deeper into these ideas. Let's look into these two subjects, these two topics of the presence and the voice of God. And let's shed some understanding when it comes to the presence of God. Let's, let's understand the presence of God. First and foremost, we need to understand that when we describe God, there's a lot of words that we use to describe God. And most of them are, are preceded with the, the phrase omni in front of it. Omnipotent omniscient, omnipresent, which means all, all-knowing, all-present, all-seeing. God, his presence is everywhere. In everything of creation, in all of creation, God's presence exists. You see, when we learn to see God and his presence in all of his creation, we begin to realize that God's presence is not just in a building, God's presence is not just in a house. God's presence is not just during a song. God's presence is not just goosebumps. But that God's presence is everywhere. Uh, one of my heroes, uh, people, I, lo I love his readings. Uh, I, I'm a guy, I just like everything outdoors. 
Anything outside, I love it. Now, I found that my, my joy, my passion comes from the mountains. I think because of my skin complexion, my, you know, Pastor, uh, Pastor Dan called me Pastor Redbeard, you know, just, uh, I don't do well with the beach. So I found my joy in the mountains. And, and a man that I related to, and, and I've read many of his books and his journals, was John Muir. A young man who was raised by a Presbyterian father, who is the father of our national parks, which are celebrating 100 years. Get out and see one of them. You'll be amazed. He saw God in the majesty of creation. The problem with humanity is, is we're looking for something to worship. And so what happens is we begin to see God in creation. And what happens is just like the children of Israel, we begin to see God as creation. We can't get so wrapped up in seeing God's presence in his creation that we begin to see God's creation as God because that's not the truth. But rather God is in, his presence is in his creation. To see what the, the sunset does after a rainstorm. To look at the mountains, to see the trees, to see the birds of the air. To understand that in God's creation, his presence exists. We realize that there is nowhere we can go where we cannot experience God's presence. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says in Psalms 139, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? He says, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in hell, you are there. See, when we understand that God's presence is everywhere, we don't have to go to a specific location. We don't have to listen to a specific song. We don't have to hear a specific preacher. But we realize that God's presence is everywhere. We begin to see that our eyes are opened in our pursuit of God. But there's something very important for us to understand about God's presence. And that is this, that God's presence and the manifestation or the display of God's presence are not one and the same. Let me say that again. God's presence and the display of God's presence are not one in the same. You see, God is present even when you are completely and wholly unaware that he is present. He's still there. No matter where you go, the heights or the depths of your life, the good or the low, listen, God is there in the morning. He's there in your car. He's there at your home. Listen, God is even there when you're in the bath. But the manifestation of his presence or the display of God's presence only comes to us when and while we are wholly aware of his presence. So God's presence is always there, but it's only made known to us when we are aware and while we are aware of his presence. Those men that I talked about, Paul the Apostle, Augustine, Martin Luther, John Wesley, let's go back, Abraham and Moses and David, Isaiah, Elijah. These are all men that span many generations. They came from different ethnicities, from different tribes, different, different countries. They, 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 didn't, they were never born in the same. There was very little that was common about them except one thing. They were all men who, for one, changed their world, for number two, lived and dwelt in the presence of God. You see, the pursuit of God had become so important to them that it was the largest and greatest thing in their life, and they developed a receptivity to God's presence. Because a receptivity to God, to understand, God, I realize and I recognize and I am aware and I am awake right now that you are here then they begin to realize that God is there and they see and experience the presence of God in their lives. And their lives begin to change. You see, when we surrender ourselves in obedience to the Holy Spirit, when we surrender our lives in obedience to God and we give ourselves wholly to the pursuit of God, then we are aware and awake of God and his presence in our lives despite our location, despite our preference. And when we are awake and aware to God, God manifests or displays his presence in our lives. And when God displays or manifests his presence, that takes you 
It makes the fundamental difference between being a nominal Christian and being a Christian whose face shines radiant with the glory of God. Think about it. Moses was there in the presence of God 40 days and 40 nights, sustained by God's presence. His face shone. They were afraid to look at him because when he came off the mountain from the presence of God, they said, cover your face. You're glowing with God's presence and we can't look at that. God's presence is only manifest to us when we are receptive. But receptivity is not this divine, unavoidable force that we can't stay away from. Receptivity is a gift from God that, like any gift, can be ignored or can be cultivated and accepted. These men exemplified seeking after God. Last week we were there in the Psalms. God says, seek my face. The psalmist says, my heart said to you, Lord, I will seek your face. You see, the cry of his heart, the purpose of his life was not to just casually go after God, but rather to seek the face of God was his heart's cry. Have you ever wondered why some people seem to find God and some people seem to miss that some people search and they find him, and some people search and never find God. You ever wondered why? The answer I say, the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. Because you see, God would never do for one what he would not do for all. The Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. And so if God would reveal himself to one, the problem does not lie then with God. The problem then lies with us. Remember I said this is not like an amen, hallelujah message because nobody wants a message to tell you that you're the problem. <laughs> but you see, our problem in our day and age, we are a microwave generation. And I'm not just speaking to the young people when I say generation. Our culture our lives, from the industrial revolution all the way till now, we are a microwave generation in that we want results and now. And so when we go to God and we say, God, I need your help, and I need it now, and we do not get it, we think, well, God must have a problem. And we miss the pursuit of God. We miss the presence of God in our lives. Today I'll read you just this little quote that's, I mean, just rattled my cages. You see, we are a generation of Christians reared among push buttons and automatic machines. We're impatient of slower and less direct methods of reaching our goals. We've been trying to apply machine age methods and relations with, to our relations with God. You see, we read our chapter, we have our short devotions, and we rush away hoping to make up for our deep and inward bankruptcy by attending another gospel meeting, listening to another thrilling sto story told by a religious adventurer lately returned from afar. But you see, the tragic results of this spirit are all about us. Shallow lives, hollow religious philosophies, the element of fun in gospel meetings, the glorification of men, Trust in religious externalities, quasi-religious fellowships, salesmanship methods, the mistaking of a dynamic personality for the power of the Spirit. These, and such as these, are symptoms of an evil disease, a deep and serious malady of the soul. That was written 70 years ago. Before iPods, before the internet, before text messaging. We are a culture that are so used to convenience at our fingertips that we try to apply our culture's teachings to our Christian walk. And we miss out on God. Because the pursuit of God is not something that is done in an instant. The pursuit of God is, done, is something that is done over the course of our entire lives.
And so when we seek and when we ask and we don't hear immediately or instantly, we turn away and we wonder, where is God? And we cry out, I haven't heard, I haven't felt, I haven't experienced God, when all along God says to his church, I am here, I am there, but I am waiting for you to wake up to be aware, because I will show you my presence when you are awake. Yes, amen. 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 Which means, church, we don't need to find the presence of God in a building. Church, we don't need to find the presence of God in our favorite song. We don't need smoke and lights or no smoke and lights. We don't need a pastor or a preacher to speak the presence of God to us. We need God. That's what we need. And when we realize that our pursuit is about seeking Him, His way, on His timing, then we are awake and aware. And when we are awake and aware, God will manifest himself. And when he does, our lives will go from being a nominal Christian to being a Christian whose face shines with God's glory. You know, as a pastor, as a preacher, I have the obligation to live what I preach. Praise God. I knew exactly what I was talking about four weeks ago. I knew this message. All week long, I, was, I knew where I was going, I knew about it, but when it came time to write my notes, to send to the video department, to put them on the screens, I could not connect point A to point B. Even though I'd been sitting on it for four weeks, couldn't make a thought, couldn't come to a logical conclusion. I sat there and stared. I turned up my worship music. I said, well, God, I'll just listen and I'll sing some songs and I'll praise you. My wife, Stacy, on the front row, she shares a corner of my office on a little desk, and finally I says, I, I'm not getting anything. I need, I need to get into the presence of God. And she says, okay, I'll be quiet. <laughs> so I kind of sit there and I stare at her and I'm like, get out. <laughs> she left, I had to turn off my lights, close my blinds. I had to put a big sign on my window that says, don't talk to me. <laughs> Turned off my worship music. I crawled under my desk and I laid face down on the floor because I couldn't stop thinking about what's going on outside, what's happening tomorrow. What's, I had all these different distractions. So I took everything away and I laid on the floor with my face on the floor. And I sat there and I said, God, make me aware of your presence right now. Boom. God hit me. Picked up my pen with my face on the ground and I just started writing didn't even need to see it. Because when we are awake and aware, we will experience the presence of God because his desire for us is to not live a life seeking and groping in the darkness, but that we would look and that we would find him. But if we don't do it with our hearts, God's way, we will miss him. Let's talk about hearing God's voice. Hearing his voice, I have never heard God's voice, but I've heard God. See, I say that because we think of it like Jesus being baptized, like Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my son. We say, hear God's voice, and we equate hear to our physical ears. I have never, with my physical ears, heard the voice of God. But I said it two weeks ago. We have eyes and ears with our soul that we see and we hear. They might be dim because of a lifetime of misuse, but because of the life-giving power of Jesus Christ, we can be quickened to see sharper and to hear, uh, hear better than we have ever heard. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt in my life that I have not heard God with my ears, but I have heard God's voice in my soul. Think about it like this. Everybody in here, you felt it at some point. 
Something that logic, that senses, that, 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 that intellect cannot describe or explain. You felt that deep sense of loneliness. That, that chilling feel that comes over you, or maybe that uh, unexplicable sense of comfort. You felt somebody was watching you. Even though you hadn't seen them, you're like, ooh. <laughs> You've been there. You felt it. Despite trying to explain it, trying to reason with it. Well, it must have been this and this and this. There's no explanation, but yet nobody can tell you otherwise. Why? Because you have experienced it. It's the gateway to your soul. And you see, we've got to understand that God is not a God who spoke. God is a God who speaks. Somebody asked, well, how do I hear the voice of God? How do I know it's God speaking or not just me? So easy. So simple. His words. His words. People say, oh, pastor, pastor, uh, this is what's going on. What, tell, me, tell me what God wants me to do. And I say, well, the Bible says, ah, I, I know what the Bible says. What does God say? Hello? <laughs> the words of God. Jesus says in John, the sixth chapter, Jesus says, man, the, the flesh doesn't profit anything, but the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. You see, the words of God are not just something written down on the pages of a book that we can put on a shelf and say that's some good teaching, that's some good ways to live. These are the words of God that are alive and powerful, that are sharper than any two-edged sword, as the Bible says. We've got to stop seeing as these as words that God spoke and see it as words that God is speaking. This is the voice of God. You see... When God speaks, he doesn't just say something and then it's followed by silence. I can speak. It's done. When God speaks, nothing silences his words. Jesus says in the book of Matthew, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. You see, God is not a God who spoke. God is a God who speaks spirit and in life. Think about it like this. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning. The very first time we have uh, an understanding of God's words. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 3. God said, let there be light. Boom! Did I wake you up? <laughs> the big bang. All of a sudden, light God spoke to nothing, and something came from it. But did you know that even though God spoke that at creation, the Bible or the science has even revealed to us today that the universe is still growing, expanding, that light is still emitting from the center, from the epicenter of the universe where God spoke, which means when God speaks, his words don't go silent after he speaks them. They are spirit. They are life. They are truth. Just like the universe grows, what God spoke, God speaks. The problem with our lives is our flesh, like Jesus says, prophets, nothing. Our flesh looks at that and says, past tense. That was spoken 2,000 years ago. What does God say today? But just like Jesus says, my words will never pass away. You see, the problem with our Christian unbelief is a misconception and a misunderstanding of the scriptures of the truth. We think of it as a God who spoke into a book. And when the book was finished, resorted back to silence forever. But God speaks. Amen. Let me say it like this. God is in a speaking mood. My wife, she's, like, she's famous for it, man. I love, her. I love her. It's awesome. It's like right when I'm ready to go to bed. You breathe that last big breath and you're about to fall asleep. Tell me what you're thinking. <laughs> ah. I don't want to talk right now. Anybody ever been, I don't feel like talking. We think, well, God wasn't in a speaking mood. He was in a mood. 
God had a mood swing. He felt like speaking. He wrote the Bible. He's done. No. No. God is in a speaking mood. As a matter of fact, the second member of the Trinity proves it. Jesus. You know why? Jesus has a name. You know what Jesus' name is? The Word. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse number 2. He was in the beginning with God. Verse number 3. All things that were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. God's in a speaking mood, church. Proven through his son, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it even goes even further than that. Jesus says, when I go to heaven with the Father, you get something special. You get the Holy Spirit. And he says, the Father will send in my name, and he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance the things I have said. God is in a speaking mood to you. What happens is we don't want to listen because we want words our way. God, if you're real, thunder to me. I am God. But God is saying, when you listen, when you're awake, when you're aware, when you pursue me, you will find me. Like Elijah in the cave, not a fire, not an earthquake, not a, not a rushing wind, a whisper. Samuel in the night thought it was Eli, and finally he was conditioned to say, here I am. These are not just pages in a book. These are the words of God today for you. Amen. God is speaking into your life through his words. If you didn't miss or grab the application out of understanding that, I'll give you three things, and I'm only going to spend seven minutes on three things. Because really, to me, the application was right there. If we can understand that, we're good. But I'll help you out. I'll give you three words to help cultivate your pursuit of God. Three simple words. To help cultivate the awareness and the, and the uh, 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 listening to God's voice. Consecration, concentration, contemplation. Those three simple words. Consecrate. The king will not open his inner courts to the unrighteous, the unjust, the unrepentant. You see, the understanding in the pursuit of God is that the pursuit of God can only be done through Jesus Christ. Somebody had asked, well, what, Pastor Luke, what about all the other religions of the world that they profess that there's one God? It sounds so similar. The only way we can successfully pursue and know God is through consecration of Jesus Christ. Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Tells us this, Hebrews 10th chapter, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, the court of God, the inner presence of God, by the blood of Jesus, look at verse number 20, tells us, by a new living way which he consecrated, cleaned us, washed us through the veil that is his flesh. Verse number 21 goes, having a high priest over the house of God, verse 22, that let us draw near with a true heart. Consecration. Through Jesus Christ, the washing, sprinkling, washing of the water of the Word of God. Concentration. Those men that we talked about who changed the world, their lives echoed the pursuit of God. It was the largest and most important thing in their lives. And because of it, their world was changed. They were focused we get so wrapped up on a rabbit trail. Well, oh, oh, they're singing this kind of music over here. Oh, 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 well, there's this, there's this, this preacher, he's over here. And oh, well, this church I heard is, is doing over here. Well, I, I don't need to go to church anymore. The pastor said this, I'm going to go over here. And, and, and I'm going to get distracted over here. And, and I'm going to do this over here. And maybe it's this over here. And we get so wrapped up that we lose our focus. 
We begin to worry about everything around us. What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? What am I going to do? God, what are you going to do for me tomorrow? I don't know about my job. I don't know about my money. I don't know about... And we start focusing on everything else. Jesus says that is what the Gentiles... The Gentiles are those who do not know God. That is, those, that is for those who are on the outside looking in. He says that's what they worry about. He says about you and I because of Jesus Christ having been accepted into the beloved. He says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And everything else will be added to you. Concentrate. Focus on your pursuit of God. Contemplation. Psalmist David continually sang songs continually reminded himself, continually fed himself of God's faithfulness. When David went to Saul, he said, it was God that delivered me from the lion. It was God that delivered me from the bear. It will be God that delivers me from this uncircumcised Philistine. He had rehearsed. He had contemplated. He had memorized. He had reflected. He had fed himself God's words, God's promises, God's presence. Do you think that every time Abraham walked outside at night, after God told him, I will make your descendants like the sands of the seashore and the stars in the sky, do you think that every time Abraham looked up, he contemplated what God had said to him? To feed yourself. The Bible tells us in Psalms, one of the favorite verses of my life, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. We get so wrapped up in contemplating and thinking about everything else. Let us contemplate God's word, God's presence. He reveals himself when we're awake and when we're aware. He speaks when we are listening. Church, are you awake? Are you listening? God wants to do something in your life. Let's pray today. Father, we come before you. Lord, we're just so grateful for the word. We're so grateful for the challenge of the pursuit of God. We're so grateful for the fact that Jesus Christ has brought us from the outside in. Lord, forgive us that we have been so busy searching for you how we want. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become aware of your presence all around us, that we might see and be aware that you are with us and live in your presence. Lord, help us to become aware of your voice through your word, to listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit as we read your words, to not see them as a words in a book thousands of years ago, but Lord, that we would see them as words of God speaking to us today, leading us and directing us and guiding us to be what you've called us to be. Open our eyes, God. Open our ears today as we pursue you more. Lord, may we turn this world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? Hey, before we leave today, I want to take just a quick moment. I'm not going to keep you much longer. But you see, it would be a travesty. It would be a shame for us to leave today under the pretenses that everybody in this building, everybody in this room is in the right standing with God. When in reality, many of you or some of you in this place are not. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to examine yourself because you see the fact, the hard truth of life is, like my friend said yesterday, we're all one, we're all one virus. We're all one epidemic. We're all one car accident or, or, or happenstance away from our eternal lives. And nobody knows the day or the hour. Most people in the world say they don't want to know. But the truth of the matter is, is that there will be a time in your life, and I don't want to try to preach gloom and doom to you, but there will be a time in your life in which you do not know that you will be forced to face eternity. And the Bible is very clear. We have two options, heaven or hell. Today I want to ask you, what would happen if you died? You say, well, you know, I've never felt, of, I never felt heaven. I've never seen about, I heard about that story that was fake in the book, and the author came back and said it was. Listen, it doesn't matter whether you've seen it, experienced it, or felt it before. Heaven, hell are a real place. Just like we talked about today, the emotions, that, that sense, that feeling that you've had before, you know it's real. It's real enough for the Word of God to tell us about it, real enough for Jesus Christ to teach us about it, real enough for the Bible to be preserved over thousands of years so that we could take it serious. 
Just like you can't see, feel, or, or experience the radio waves from me to the sound booth, you know that they exist because you can hear the sound of my voice over the speaker system. Heaven's a real place. So often I hear, well, I have a hard time believing in a God that would send, a loving God that would send men to hell. The question is not how can a loving God send men to hell. The question is how can a logical man reject a loving God? You see, God is not in the business of condemning men to hell. Jesus didn't come to judge the world. He came to redeem it. And despite what we want, despite what we desire, despite what we think, we can't hope, wish, or want our way to heaven. We can't spend enough time in religious dogma or orthodoxy that we might be rewarded for heaven. We can't pay enough penance. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't be good enough to get into heaven. The only way we can get there is God's way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to accept the gift of God, the Bible says, is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. In the book of John, Jesus is speaking to a religious leader, and he says these words, in order to see the kingdom of God, in order to inherit the kingdom of God, you must be born again. What does that mean? Oh, I know what Hollywood and the internet makes that out to be. Listen, I don't care what Hollywood or society has made it out to be. Born again from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Like we talked about today, consecration. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. You see, the Bible tells us Jesus is in his final plea to the church. In the book of Revelation, Jesus says... I'm coming back. And when I come back, I hope that you're hot or that you're cold because I, he says, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. <laughs> He's trying to make a statement to the church, to you and I. He says, you think you're wealthy. You think you're rich, but you don't realize how naked you are. And his final plea to us, his church, is to give me your heart, to give me your life. It's an all or nothing relationship. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Lukewarm simply means you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. Occasional church attendance doing some of your own things, some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for him. You're not wholehearted against him. You're riding the fence. Come on. You know that's you. You know that position. You know it's an uncomfortable place to be. And I love you enough, I respect you enough, and honor you enough today to tell you you're not going to make it. Today, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He won't force his way or make his way. And listen, Jesus Christ died on a cross with the spite and shame hung naked for our sin and our shame. And in return, God wants our heart. He wants our life. Jesus says these words. He says, if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. The decision's yours. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. I'll count to three in just a moment. I'll go one, two, and then the count of three, I'll go three. And when I do, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You see, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, you know what? I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge you. Put it right back down. I won't embarrass you. You say, man, I don't know if I can do that. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed, wouldn't it be better? to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? Listen, I'll be honest with you. That is a very confrontational message today in general. But if you can't go forward for God in a warm and welcome and loving place like the church, what makes you think outside of these walls in the real world that you'll do it there? It starts today by making the decision. That's what you're doing today. Who should raise your hands? If you've never given them your heart, you've never given them your life. If that's you in just a moment, get ready. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Maybe you're not sure. You did this as a child in the youth group or you went to Harvest Crusade or you prayed that prayer once before on TV, but you've never really followed through with it. If that's you in this place, get ready in just a moment. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying running from God instead of to God, you've been playing church, you know who you are. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. Today, if that's you, God's speaking to you. Don't wait another minute. When I count to three, if that's you, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And we'll go forward together in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Accepting life today. It's not just about what happens when you die. Jesus says, I have come to give you life and abundant life. It starts by filling that void on the inside of you that you have sought all your life to fill, but it can only be filled by Jesus Christ. It starts today by accepting that gift. So all across this auditorium, from the front to the back, the side to side, listen, I, whether you've been in this church for an hour or you've been here for 26 years, it doesn't matter. What matters today is the condition of your heart, the condition of your soul. And if that's you, just a moment, get ready. If you're watching at home online, if that's you, get ready. You could raise your hand too. When you minimize the screen, there'll be a blue button that says, no God, click that button. Pray the prayer. If that's you in this place today, you get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. And when I do, pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three.
Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven back there. Seven wise people. Anybody over here, ushers? Eight, I got you right over there, my man. Nine, I see you right over there as well. Nine wise people. Ten, I see you right there. Ten wise people. You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. I see ushers pointing over there. I got you right over there in the gray. I got you. Eleven. Ushers are pointing over here. Twelve. All right, I see you back there in the back. Twelve wise people say, man, I wonder if I should. Hey, listen, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. This is your moment. This is your time. I got you right over here. Thirteen. Say, man, I wonder if that's me. It's you. The goodness of God is speaking to you. The spirit of God's on you right now. Don't reject the gift. Today is your day of salvation. Anybody else in this place today? Twelve, thirteen wise people. Anybody else today? I'm going to conclude right now. Let's give God a great big praise for them. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. For all of those that you, all of those of you that raised your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you say, man, I know I should have. He was talking to me and I didn't do it. Listen, that's okay. Just a moment. We're going to do something together. You don't get saved by raising your hand and say, I want to. I'm making that decision. Now, whenever you make a decision, now you've got to follow up that decision with action. And that's what we're going to do right now. You're going to follow up with action. You're going to give your heart and you're going to give your life to Jesus Christ. We're going to do that together. So if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Grab your whole family if you need to. That's okay. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisle and come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together right here, right now. Let's all stand together, please. Nobody leave as they come. But if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on. Come meet me right here, right now. Jesus, Let's go together. Jesus, if that's you, you come. Come on, wherever you're at. You're the reason that I live. Come on. You're the reason that I sing. Jesus, I believe in you. If that's you, come on. Jesus, I belong. You can come. To you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I sing. Jesus, I believe. Come, come on. If that's you, we'll wait. Come on. Congratulations. God bless you guys. God bless you. Keep fine. All right. Hey guys, listen, I want to tell you something. First and foremost, I'll tell you something. You're not going to a funeral, all right? You can wipe that frown upside down. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. You're going to give your life to Jesus Christ today. Your best days are ahead of you. The past is behind you, the future's all ahead of you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus the Lord and Savior, asking him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. What does that mean, Lord and Savior? We don't talk like that very often anymore. How about this, the leader of your life? You're going to invite him into your life. We're going to give you some free information. We're going to invite you to come back and connect you with a friend here at the church to get you connected. You say, well, you walk out of here and say, what do I do next? We're going to help do that with you. We're going to walk you through the process. We're going to invite you to come back. We'll buy you a cup of coffee at our cafe, get you a taco or a french fries or something like that. Sit down with you for a couple of weeks with a friend, somebody that will teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of your, uh, in your life. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over here with my friend, Pastor Joel. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to pray with you guys right over there. Awesome. Congratulations, guys. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.